great honor for me to speak uh, in, in the celebration of, of Evelyn's career and her birthday. Happy birthday. I know I missed it. It was a few weeks ago, um, but uh, I'm delighted to be here, uh, especially with this uh, great group of speakers. And so I'll give you a little bit of um, uh, uh, background about um, uh, DNA repair and repair choices and talk about um, sensors and things uh, that are directly uh, derived from Evelyn's work, and then go into a, a short story about uh, a particular DA repair pathway that we've been studying. So I want to give an overview of uh, DNA repair choices. And um, uh, there are some choices that are relatively easy. Uh, and these are where individual bases are damaged, and then they're sort of chopped out and patched over, sort of like you can think of it about as, um, uh, you know, like fixing a pothole on the road. And these happen all the time. These are dedicated machines for doing that. Of course, even though they're easy choices, I, I would note that, that they did give out a Nobel Prize for this, uh, maybe 20 years after they should have, <laughs> but it's the chemist. So um, uh, now there are, these are easy choices, but then there are harder choices. So for example, if you have a double strand break, what do you do with it? Do you try to do homologous recombination? Well, how do you decide whether you want to do that or not? And if you do, how do you find a partner? Or do you do non-homologous end joining? And there are different types of non-homologous end joining. Some that occur in heterochromatic DNA uh, are the, the, the event you want to avoid, which is an uncapped telomere. And then there are programmed uh, recombination events uh, and immunoglobulin uh, generation, VDJ recombination and class switch recombination. Uh, these happen over megabases. So it's very complicated and you have to have a lot of precision there. And those are hard choices. And then there are even harder choices. And these occur at replication forks. So replication machinery is just one of the most beautiful and complex and large uh, factories of, of enzymes that are coordinately you know, taking chromatin, which is densely packed, stripping away its cover, pulling it apart, copying one strand, and then back copying the other strand, and then reassembling it with all its marks and re-chromatinizing it. And this is very complicated. Now, what I've drawn here is just a cartoon. It's, it's, it's 100 times more complicated than this. So when there's a problem at a replication fork, it can be a big problem. This whole machinery can just fall apart and you just have to fix it because if you don't, you're gonna die. And I think that the, the best uh, analogy is, is a, uh, a bridge collapse. And you can imagine that when this happens, you're not just gonna patch it. You have to have a lot of coordination to get the right machines in, get the materials built, get them in the right order, get the right uh, machines uh, working and get the, make sure the wrong machines don't get in there and orchestrate this entire repair process. It's very complicated. So you need to have a lot of organization. Now cells are blind. And in order to make the right choices, they need to avoid all of these wrong choices. And for that, they need sensors. They need sensors to um, detect what structure is there. You have to know what you're looking at. You have to feel it. You have to have things there and say, yep, this is it. You have to re, uh, relay information to enzymes and say, yeah, we need you and you, but not you. And we need you in this order. And then I want you to all go away. And then some other things are going to happen. You need to coordinate, um, for example, the cell cycle. You know, this is another independent uh, function that's going forward. You need to send signals to the immune system. Well, why would you need to do that, at least in eukaryotes? And, and that's because lots of viruses look like DNA damage. And so you want to tell the immune system, hey, come look at me. Uh, I might have a viral infection. Um, and then there are other larger decisions that happen. There are you, cells sometimes decide on whether or not they want to uh, go into apoptosis and kill themselves. It's particularly important in blood cells um, that uh, if they gain the wrong kinds of mutations can, can run wild quite easily. Uh, and then other cells decide that, well, we want to keep the cell, even though it's had a lot of damage, we're going to differentiate into a senescent cell. And senescent cells accumulate as we age, and, and they're sending signals to your body all the time that end up creating an inflammatory uh, environment and actually cause aging. So um, all this stuff is emanating from the sensors. And 
two sensory pathways have independently evolved during evolution. The prokaryotic pathway, which is the SOS pathway that Evelyn and her colleagues uh, discovered. And I wanna say it's not just the pathway, it's a concept. Um, and um, it, it's a very powerful concept that, that there are sensors and they're, and they're regulating things uh, in a way to, to promote repair. And then a, a different uh, system, the eukaryotic DNA damage response. And that um, uh, these require different sensors. And so in the prokaryotes, it's REC A. And in uh, the uh, DNA damage response, it's ATM and ATR among others, because there are other sensors uh, for particular types of damage. But this core sensory machinery um, actually recognizes the same sorts of structures, which is single-stranded DNA, at least largely, or double-strand breaks. Now, although they evolved independently, they weren't completely discovered independently uh, because, um, because Evelyn's work in the SOS pathway uh, was foundational. And I was a graduate student in uh, Graham Walker's lab, studying the SOS response, uh, and studying inducible mutagenesis. And it was the most exciting time to be in science as far as I was concerned. There was all this incredible bacterial genetics going on at the time and phage genetics. And then there was this SOS pathway, which was very cool and counterintuitive that you need proteins to make mutations. And although when I left Graham's lab, I never intended to work on DNA repair again. Um, as a postdoc, I stumbled upon something that showed inducible transcription of very large magnitude uh, in response to blocking uh, uh, DNA replication. And I knew immediately what I had grown into because I understood the SOS response. And I looked at this and I said, oh, this is, there's got to be some sensors here and it's going to be a signal transduction pathway. And I, I ended up working on it. So I built a huge part of my career. Uh, dissecting this DNA damage response first in yeast and mammalian cells. Now, um, and so I, I owe a great uh, debt intellectually to, to the pioneering work that uh, Evelyn carried out, of course, and also to Graham, my mentor. Uh, and uh, I, I'd always read all about Evelyn's uh, work and everything, but I didn't meet her until I was pretty far along uh, in this whole process. Um, and I can't remember exactly when I met when we met here, but Graham had a dinner for us. It might've been at the, after the Wiley Prize or it might've been at the National Academy or something. I don't remember that, but I definitely remember the second time we met and that was when we both got the last one. And it was quite an honor for me to share that with Evelyn. And um, it was a wonderful day and uh, I really, truly, truly enjoyed it. And I have a million pictures, but I'm not gonna show them all, but I think I sent them all to Evelyn at one point. So, um, so Evelyn uh, really had a tremendous uh, and direct contribution to my work and to the, all the human work that followed from it. And so as an example of some of the work that we've been doing, I wanna talk about DNA crosslink repair. So um, uh, crosslinking agents are bifunctional. They can form monoadducts, but they can also form interstrand crosslinks or interstrand crosslinks or even protein conjugates to DNA. But these interstrand crosslinks are particularly bad because when you replicate, you have to take the DNA apart. And if it's covalently attached, Watson to Crick, um, you can't do that. And that is a very big problem. Now, some of the chemical agents that we use uh, for this, uh, our studies are these crosslinking agents like mitomycin C or cisplatin, which are also chemotherapeutics uh, used in cancer. And they crosslink guanines um, What's in the crick? Now we generate these as a tool using this, but there's actually uh, an endogenous source of these crosslinking agents, and they're from the metabolites from alcohol and aldehyde metabolism, and um, they are actually in our blood, um, causing uh, this sort of stuff in cells. And uh, this is work from uh, KJ Patel's lab who discovered this. Now there's an entire um, pathway that's evolved. Um, uh, around a human disease that's uh, um, called Fanconi anemia. And it's defective in the repair of these crosslinks. And people, it's, it, you can live with it. So homozygous mutants have growth defects and abnormal development. 
and they're, uh, they have increased cancer predisposition, but the, they're marked by anemia. That's the first thing that people see because the blood is very sensitive to damaging agents and they turn over quickly and the stem cells don't function. So let me just give you a little bit of background about um, um, this repair pathway, the Fanconi anemia pathway. And um, so this is an interstrand crosslink in ICL. And when the polymerase gets there, it basically stalls. It can't go forward. Um, and it, um, it is disassembled here uh, with some aid from other proteins uh, that I won't go into. But at this point, uh, there is a, a, a helicase, a transit case called FANC-M that, that senses this um, crosslink. And it assembles a core complex called the FANC comp core complex. They, they all have a different letter. And each one of these is mutant in a different person in the disease. And that's how they were found. Um, and um, that brings uh, the, the core complex uh, to, um, uh, to the DNA. And then um, uh, all of this is regulated by phosphorylation by ATR. Uh, and ATR phosphorylates all of these proteins and also this core clamp protein called FANC-ID. We discovered FANC-I in my, my lab. Um, and uh, uh, this phosphorylation allows the ubiquitination of this by the core complex. And that sets up an entire repair scaffold that brings in nucleases and exonucleases and endonucleases to, to start to repair this. So, um, what you can see is um, that um, that the um, machinery that brings in these nucleases makes two nicks on either side of um, the, the crosslink and allows that to be um, swiveled over. And then you bring in a translesion uh, repair polymerase uh, called, uh, this is the uh, REV complex, REV137. Uh, and that does uh, bypass, error-prone bypass, by the way, we'll get back to that in a moment, but, um, um, and then you, you fix this by homologous recombination. Now, <clears throat> interstrand crosslinks um, have a number of different angles of repair, but a more recent uh, observation has been that, that FANC-M has a second role, and that is to reverse the fork um, here. And so the reason you want to reverse the fork is that it's pretty crowded right around this area here. And you would like to have access to, to the actual lesion to do the repair. You might even be able to repair it without making double strand breaks on two strands. So, um, so um, you back up the polymerase and then you exude uh, the, the la leading and lagging strand uh, backwards in what's called a chicken foot uh, structure. So you can get, uh, get to repair this. And then you reverse the fork and you can go forward, okay? So um, what I'm gonna talk about now uh, based on this is work from um, a postdoc in my lab, uh, Richard Adiemi, it's all his work. Uh, and it starts with a genetic screen um, using CRISPR for crosslinker sensitivity. Now I'm not going to describe the CRISPR-Cas9 system, but think about it as like doing genetics and bacteria uh, only it really works and it's in humans, okay? And so um, uh, Richard did this screen and he found many components of uh, the Fanconi anemia pathway, uh, homologous recombination. Um, uh, also, uh, we have the, the, the a, uh, DNA damage response, uh, ATRIP and ATR, and ATM also stored here, as well as components of nucleotide excision repair and several genes involved in transcription, which if we have time at the end, I'll, we'll get back to. So we found a lot of things that were known, but we also found a lot of things that were not known. And I'm gonna talk about one of them today, and it's a gene called SKY. Um, uh, SKY1, we call it SKY. And uh, it was originally found to be a suppressor of cancer evasion. Not so sure how that all works. Uh, that's how it was named, but we all know it's geneticists the naming of the first discovery of a phenotype doesn't necessarily tell you much about what it's really doing. Now, there's a knockout mouse, and uh, the mouse are infertile because their testes are um, shrunk, and that's a hallmark of DNA repair defects. A lot of uh, DNA repair mutants are, have this phenotype because there's a lot of recombination that goes on during meiosis.
So um, scan is required for the proper uh, repair after DNA damage. Uh, it accumulates at uh, foci in response to uh, cisplatin or myomycin C that you don't see here. These are extracted, so you're only looking at what's on chromatin. And, um, and so they go to the sites of uh, replication blocks. And if you get rid of the sky protein using RNAi depletion and treat with uh, uh, cisplatin, what you see is that uh, you have a problem getting through S phase. You can't really replicate properly. If you wait long enough, the cells accumulate in G2 um, and they're dead. And um, they're also, uh, it also leads to accumulation of genomic instability. Um, and now these are um, uh, metaphase chromosome spreads and you can see that most chromosomes line up right next to each other. Every once in a while you'll see a break here. These have been treated with mitomycin C, by the way. Um, but in the sky mutants, you see this, these chromosomes are shattered. You see trivalence, which are characteristic of, uh, of afancomian anemia. Uh, you see breaks everywhere, little pieces and fragments of chromosomes. Uh, these cells have undergone catastrophe. So the take home messages of what I'm gonna tell you about today are that um, and, and I'll try to get through all this. Sky prevents single-stranded DNA formation at crosslinks. Okay, now I'll show you the data for each one of these. The nucleus responsible for generating that, that single-stranded DNA is XO1. Um, the single-stranded DNA that's formed in these mutants requires FANCM. And in fact, it requires the fork reversal function of FANCM. Um, Sky forms a complex with REV3 and um, and REV3 mutants actually have the same phenotype as Sky. And we think that the, uh, and I don't have the data for this, I didn't get it together to put it together yet today, but the REV3 polymerase activity is required for preventing single strand formation in response to cisplatin. So let me just take you through the first point, and that is that Sky prevents uh, a single strand DNA from being generated. And you can detect single stranded DNA by the presence of phosphorylated RPA. So in untreated cells, you, we have two uh, knockout clones of sky. You can see the protein's gone. You treat these with cisplatin. The first thing you notice is that check one phosphorylation goes up in the control cells, um, but goes up even more in the knockout clones because you're not repairing, you're still generating signals. And you're also generating a lot of phospho RPA. Okay, so why do we get fossil RPA? Well, um, we see that RPA, when you have single strand DNA, RPA in particular gets phosphorylated by ATR. It's an activator of ATR and it is a substrate for ATR. And, um, and so you can see that single strand DNA is, is uh, being made directly using a little trick. And that trick is that you grow cells in the, in the presence of bromodeoxyuridine, so it gets incorporated into the DNA on uh, one of the strands. And um, there's an antibody that detects it, but the antibody doesn't detect it if it's in double-stranded DNA. But if you have single-stranded DNA, you can see it. And so um, these are cells that are um, um, treated uh, with uh, either wild type or sky mutants treated with mitomycin C. You can see very little uh, staining with BRDU antibodies but in the sky mutant, you see a ton of it and it's quantified on the right. So this increased amount of, um, of fossil RPA is because there's more single strand DNA and there's activation of ATR. And we've blocked it with inhibitors to ATR. Second point I wanted to make is that the, the resection after sky depletion, when you treat it, the, the thing that you use to generate the single strand DNA is a nuclease called XO1. Now, XO1 is well known at double strand breaks. It has a role. Uh, and there are four or five different nucleases, and we check them one at a time. But the only one that really had an effect, a big effect, was XO1. And so you can see that here. Um, these are uh, cells, um, either wild type or sky minus, treated with cisplatin. You can see when you treat it with cisplatin, you see the single stranded uh, RNA, phospho RPA, the single stranded DNA, phospho RPA signal. Um, but when you uh, get rid of XO1, there's no signal at all. Okay, so XO1 is responsible for this. And while I won't show you the data for this, if you knock out XO1 or deplete it here, 
uh, and sky mutants and then treat them with damage, it actually suppresses part of the lethality. So you know that this excessive generation of single strand DNA is important uh, for viability and repair. Now, the third point I wanted to make is that FANCM is necessary for the single strand of DNA to accumulate in the absence of sky. Okay, so here um, we have a wild type and a sky mutant um, in uh, control siRNA cells are cells that are depleted for FANCM using siRNA. And uh, what you can see is that um, uh, looking here at the phospho-RPA in wild type cells and sky mutants with control siRNA, you see phospho-RPA, but if you get rid of FANCM, it virtually goes away completely. And this is unusual for all the Fanconi proteins because we've depleted all the other components, the core components, and FANC-I and FANC-D2, um, and um, none of them give you this phenotype. It's exclusive to FANCM. And not only that, we can add back the FANCM uh, protein and a mutant of it that's specifically defective in the fork reversal function. And um, remember, I told you that two functions, one was to, to locate the FANC, -A, FANC core complex and the other was this fork reversal. Well, the mutant defect is defective in that. So and over here, when you add that these two back, um, um, you either add back the wild type function. Well, the wild type function, um, um, you still see the, the sky phenotype here, but when you add back the mutant version of it, uh, that doesn't do a fork reversal, that's now reduced. So um, FANCM is required for, for um, uh, the single strand of DNA to be formed and um, the wild type can restore it, but the mutant can't. So uh, we think fork reversal is really important. Now, the next point I wanted to make was that um, translation synthesis polymerase, REV3 is in a complex with this, we did mass spec analysis here. And uh, what we found was that one of the most abundant proteins to come down with Sky uh, was REV3. It's uh, almost stoichiometric. It turns out that Sky is in two separate complexes. Only one of them is, um, is REV3. I don't have time to talk about the other one today. But um, um, this is very interesting, of course. REV3 is a member of the translesions um, TLS polymerase. And together, uh, Rev3 and Rev7 uh, form the Zeta complex. And, um, and uh, Rev3 is a large uh, polymerase that forms a catalytic subunit, and it can uh, actually do bypass of a, uh, of a, a non-coding lesion or a blocking lesion to synth synthesize across from damaged uh, bases. And remember, I told you that this is a known function in the Fanconi pathway. We think this is separate from that function, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, but um, I was delighted to, to run into translation polymerase because this takes me back to my roots in the SOS response when I was a grad student with Grant Walker, uh, uh, cloning UMUC and UMUD, uh, as it turned out, was my thesis project. So, uh, and this may be one of the last DNA damage papers that I publish uh, because. Uh, my work sort of take me into more virology and immunology areas these days. So this is really a great bookend uh, on, on my uh, damaged career uh, to get back to, uh, uh, to this uh, polymerase and, and this fundamental process. So um, as I said, that uh, the REV3 protein gives us the same phenotype um, as a sky mutant. And that's shown here. Um, um, if you um, have um, basically sky mutants treated with cisplatin, you get phospho-RPA. If you just take wild type cells and de deplete them for REV3 with siRNA, you get the same phenotype. And if you do them both, uh, you have the same phenotype, they're epistatic. Um, so, um, so that says that uh, they're, they're key. Um, and uh, I just want to point out that the REV1 and REV7 subunits don't do the same thing. Uh, we can delete them completely or treat them with siRNA, uh, and you do not get this phospho-RPA uh, phenotype. So we think that it's not the REV complex up here that's in, in translation synthesis, but it's a separate complex we call protexin 
that sky one and rev three are in. So let me just uh, jump to the model here, uh, what we think is going on here. And um, um, give you a little bit of, of, of our future ideas about where we're going here. So when you have a cross link, <clears throat> we think that um, the FANC-N protein uh, reverses the fork. And um, then XO1, so then you have what is basically an open-ended single double-strand break end here. And then the enzymes in the cell get at it. Uh, they think, oh, here we have a double-strand break. We've got to fix this. So exonucleases are plentiful. They, um, they chew it away. And then we actually have data I didn't show you that shows that RNA polymerase actually now gets here and makes an RNA-DNA hybrid. Well, that would block the, um, the ability of uh, any uh, um, a single strand RNA binding or DNA binding protein like RPA to get there. But then RNAs-H nicks that. And um, we think that the role of Rev3 may be to backfill this. Um, so a lot of things that aren't supposed to happen, happen. The nucleus gets their RNA polymerase, which loves single strand DNA ends. That was how the original assay for it gets there. And, and, uh, and, and then we have to, uh, to deal with, with what that is. So we take advantage of that and fix it. This still needs a little bit of work, but in the absence of sky, um, we have this uh, uh, exonuclease activity. Uh, you get RNA, uh, DNA duplexes, that's chewed away and you get single strand DNA because Rev3 doesn't fill it in. So that's our current model. And I just want to thank the people involved in this. Um, in particular, let me can I get back here. I, this is all done by one postdoc in my lab, Richard Adiemi, with some help on the screening parts uh, by people who made the libraries. But I also want to just get back to, and thank Evelyn. Uh, Evelyn's work uh, intellectually started this exciting field and inspired us to think deeply about genetics because in the early days, you really only had genetics. You only had a few mutants and you had to think hard about what they were doing. And um, so anyway, I'm happy um, uh, to uh, have been able to share this with you and to participate in this celebration of Evelyn's career and uh, her, um, uh, her life and all the important uh, contributions she's made uh, both to justice and to science and for uh, personally for providing me with information and ideas that uh, led to my entire career. So I'll stop here and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for that great talk. Uh, I think we're going to start with the panelists. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and I can call on you uh, and you know we can talk about the question. You can ask your question. Uh, any of the panelists, chairs, speakers? If not, I will move to the, the Q&A chat box. So the rest of the participants, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box now. We have plenty of time uh, for questions at this point. Okay, so, oh, go yeah. ahead. Richard, go ahead, I think you're, okay. Okay, thank you. You did mention that you found RNA polymerase two and RNA polymerase three as candidate hits in your screen. Could you comment on what you think they might be doing? Well, uh, we're, there is a role for RNA polymerase three at double strand breaks, and we're looking at that. But what we've been focused on is RNA polymerase two. And so um, RNA polymerase two actually, and I didn't go through this um, in any detail because it was just, just too much to go through, is that, that RNA polymerase two is actually in a complex with Sky also. We get almost all the subunits of RNA polymerase two. So, um, and that's a really interesting part of the story. Uh, and that's why we started looking at the RNAs. And um, the, um, what we've been able to show so far, and if you just inhibit RNA polymerase two for a short period of time, like an hour or two in the presence of cyclohexamine, you mimic the whole phenotype of sky loss. And so we think that that's actually an important part of, um, 
of what's going on. If the RNA polymerase doesn't go, doesn't get on and um, fill in that single strand DNA, you're left with, you're, you're just left with um, single strand DNA for RPA to come in. If you allow it to go in to block RNA-SH, you block the single strand DNA from getting there. So, so you, you don't see RPA. So um, it's complicated because, you know, uh, dealing with blocking RNA polymerase, you know, that's just, you're just asking for trouble, right? And initially we're doing it for 15 hours. It's like, well, we can't interpret this, but we worked on a fast assay. So that's where we are with that. Okay. Um, great. So I have a few questions coming in here at the chat box. So Dave Cortez is asking Steve, doesn't it seem like there's any reason Sky should be specific to cross links? Does it only work downstream of Thank M? What about other instances of fork reversal? Um, that's a great question, Dave. Uh, it does have phenotypes. If you uh, block um, uh, replication using the TUSTER system and impacts recombination there, uh, it also has some roles in uh, hydroxyurea rest. Um, it's not clear. Um, it, it might depend on the polarity of the double strand that's reversed and whether it's uh, got a three prime overhang or not. I think that's an interesting question, but it does have uh, some HU uh, phenotypes. So it's not solely for FANCM, but the phenotypes with, with uh, the Fanconi or cisplatin are much stronger than others. Uh, so I think that the shares repair pathways uh, with other reversal mechanisms. Okay, um, next question is from Sam Bunting. Uh, so uh, it says, I'd like to thank Dr. Elledge for his talk as an associate professor at the uh, Rutgers Department of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry. I always teach Dr. Elledge and Dr. Witkin's work in my 408 molecular biology and graduate courses. I had a couple of questions about Sky. First, is single-stranded DNA formation in Sky knockout cells affect, uh, is affected by loss of the fork reversal enzymes ZRAN B3 or SMART Cal1? Second, well, is there any- As far as we can tell, the answer is no. Um, we looked at those specifically. But that might work in other contexts as I was, this reference to Dave Cortez's question. Uh, and then there's a second part to Sam's question. Uh, second, is there any evidence that Sky one mutations are uh, linked to Fanconi anemia in humans? Uh, to my knowledge, no. Okay, um, so we have a question from Graham Walker. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. <clears throat> Steve, so um, <clears throat> the uh, in uh, Paul Zeta, the, there are the two binding sites on rev3 that are bound by the seatbelt of rev7 and that seems to be important for the structure of that in this complex is i couldn't you said if you depleted rev7 it didn't make a difference do you think it's present there or something else might be doing that i think it is oh. present but i not um we definitely did the genetics on it so it's not required mm -hmm. um we have that deleted for sure because we got those strains from uh, alan d'andrea and um we also I, uh, you know, we've done uh, phenotypically depleted uh, Rev1 and don't see the same effect. So they may be there, but they're not important uh, for the functionality of the complex. Okay, um, next question is from Shay Kovo. How Rev3 is recruited to the chicken foot? Is it due to Sky1? Uh, what about other DNA polymerases? Uh, good question. Uh, we don't know the answer to that yet. It's certainly a, a question we've discussed looking at, but we haven't done it. Um, next question is from Jian Shen. How about a uh, DNA repriming process? Would a defect of the repriming step also cause excessive single-stranded DNA in SCAL1, uh, SCAL1 mutant? Um, that is the, um, 
I'm not, I'm not sure about exactly what he's referring to because there are certain repair processes where you sort of skip over the lesions and keep replicating. And if that's the repriming, or as he mean the fork reversal, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I think that um, um, there, is, there is a possibility that there could be single-stranded DNA generated on the lagging strand, um, but it wouldn't necessarily require the fork reversal activity. And so for that reason, that's why we're following the fork reversal.